The following podcast was recorded on Monday, March 13th, 2023, featuring Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Training at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Sam Rines of Arbor Data Science. Good morning, Sam. Good morning, Kristen. Today, Sam talks about energy one year later and one year forward. Sam, it's been one year since Russia invaded Ukraine and oil markets have begun to calm down. Earlier in 2022, you pointed out that even with the U.S. economy under pressure and the Fed hiking rates, energy was the place to hide. Is that still the case today? It's interesting. And uh, the answer to that question is, it depends. Uh, But yes, uh, probably it it remains a place to hide. Not necessarily because I think oil prices themselves are going to remain incredibly high and, you know, call it the 80 to $120 area. It's that you don't quite have the same dynamic that you once had in the oil patch, which was oil prices go high and you drill, 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 drill. Uh, This time around really has been different on that front in terms of returning capital to shareholders instead of putting it into the ground. Uh, So you haven't seen the type of supply reaction that you would normally have to the demand that we've seen and the pricing that we've seen. So while oil prices don't necessarily have as much upside as they do with a shock of an invasion of Ukraine by Russia, you do have oil companies that are highly profitable at 70 to $80 a barrel of oil Uh, that are returning a significant amount of capital. So yes, I do still think it's a place to hide, but not because of the, necessarily because of the oil price, because the oil price over the last year didn't induce stupidity in the oil patch like it typically does. And we want to start off today by taking a look at the U.S. Strategic Petroleum Reserve. We have a chart to show here. And Sam, what role has it played this past year and what's the current position? Yeah, so it's been an incredibly important part of keeping oil prices in check, uh, particularly uh, in Europe and the U.S. Uh, to a lesser extent, Asia, you, you know, there were some barrels that the U.S. shipped over there, but particularly, uh, call it soaking up some of the supply gap that Russia's cutoff of the continent created. It was an incredibly important part of maintaining a stable oil environment. Where, where it gets really interesting from here is that you really don't have that much of, call it a fear factor uh, for global energy markets anymore. Uh, The US Strategic Petroleum Reserve is is kind of a hammer uh, to the market. It's it's one of those threats that you can issue to oil producers, both domestically and uh, globally, to say, hey, if if you don't increase output, we're going to pump from the strategic reserve and that's going to hit oil prices regardless. And that's always kind of been this kind of behind the scenes weapon that the US could use. It's still there. You still have some barrels you can pump, but it's a much less of a threat than it was. You you don't have, call it 800 million barrels sitting there just ready to to go. It's it's a much smaller amount now. And that's that's a very important thing for us to kind of consider as we move through what happened in, you know, in the year from the invasion, what happens in the year going forward. It's really important to keep in mind that there simply isn't as much of a threat of the U.S. throwing oil on the market as there once was. And in fact, the U.S. wants to try to refill the SPR at somewhere around $70 a barrel, which frankly isn't going to happen anytime soon. I mean, you have a, you have a, bank collapse and markets fretting and oil still doesn't make it down into the U.S.'s buying range, I think that's a signal of mm, maybe maybe it's going to be a while before the U.S. begins to put some barrels of oil in the ground for later. What's the relationship between rate hikes and oil prices? Ah, this is interesting. The, the Fed tends to hike rates in, in two environments. One, when growth is doing very well and when inflation is, when inflation is 
uh, picking up and or elevated. And those two tend to go hand in hand. So when the Fed is hiking, you tend to have a good environment for oil consumption, right? You tend to consume more oil consumption when you're growing at a rapid rate and less when you're not. Uh, so as the economy is slowing, as the economy is you know going into a recession, and the Fed is cutting rates, you tend to have oil prices overreact to the downside. So it's one of those interesting kind of metrics where when the when the Fed is either hiking rates or holding rates steady, it tends to be a signal of a relatively strong economy and good outlook for oil and energy markets. And when the Fed is cutting, it is an exceptionally bad time to be long uh, oil um, and gas generally. So it's it's an interesting dynamic where when the Fed's hiking, it's kind of an interesting place to hide away from, you know, call it the interest rate sensitive markets. And when the Fed's cutting, it's a good time to get away. And Sam, we want to take a look at the next chart, um, which is change in stock prices since the start of the Ukraine war. What has the performance been for oil and gas equities? Ooh, unless you were one of the state-run oil companies, it was a very, very good time to be an energy company. Just kind of pointing out two things. Unless you were Saudi Aramco or PetroChina, it was amazing. And that's kind of for two reasons. One, um, those are basically piggy banks for their uh, respective governments. When they tend to do well, they tend to have a significant amount of the cash uh, taken uh, out of the system. Uh, so they can do various things. So during COVID, if you needed to stimulate your economy, you, if you're Saudi Arabia, guess where you found those dollars? Um, you found them from Saudi Aramco. Uh, but when it comes to call it the large global majors, Exxon Mobil, BP, et cetera, uh, one, they did not put a whole lot of capital back into the ground. They, you know, it's, and this is a very important point here. It, you know, when you read through some of the investor reports, it says, you know, they invested 20, 25% uh, back into the ground. That is an interesting figure because when you look at how much the cost increase was year over year, it's 20, 25%. Uh, so that was basically what we would call maintenance capital of maintaining output, not expanding output. Uh, so maybe you get two or 3% more barrels uh, if you get some really good efficiencies, but you don't get an, a significant amount of output. So even though there's a lot of this capital expenditure money being th put into, quote unquote, the ground, it's basically maintenance capital. It's not a significant amount of uptick. On, but for the majors, the majors really returned a lot of capital, whether it was buying back their own shares, paying dividends, in a lot of cases, both. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of capital being returned. And on the margins, there were some interesting things done, particularly by BP, uh, when it came to making investments longer term on a profitable basis uh, in the alternative energy markets, you know, non-fossil uh, fuel markets, which I think are pretty interesting when we go through longer term. A lot of these, a lot of their capital budgets are to diversify away from just being fossil fuel companies into a much broader energy landscape which again, takes away from how much more they're going to drill and makes the oil side of their business much more attractive for shareholders as we move forward. We've talked in the past on this podcast about the importance of China's reopening. Can you put in perspective what a full reopening would mean in terms of oil production? Yeah, so in terms of oil production and oil consumption, unless you kind of really haircut how quickly China's going to grow in 2023 and wants to grow in 2024, you have to get to an incremental 1.5 to 2.5 million barrels over the next 18 months, which is uh, not a trivial amount of oil to be pumped out of the ground, particularly when you're running into some, call it mediocre production numbers in the United States, particularly in Texas. And by mediocre, I just mean flat. So even if you're just flat in the U.S., U.S. was one of the major incremental pumpers of oil over the last 10, you know, call it 10, 20 years. When the world needed more oil, it didn't necessarily go to Saudi Arabia. It didn't necessarily go to the Middle East. It came to the United States for, you know, that incremental barrel. So it's, it's, it's questionable how you're going to get that million and a half to two million barrels in the next 18 months unless you have a significant uptick in Saudi Arabian production. Maybe you have some sort of breakthrough in Iran. You 
simply don't have the ability to pump that much in Venezuela. You could throw as much money as you wanted, and you're still not going to get enough out of uh, the Venezuelan uh, oil fields uh, anytime soon. And when Russia is looking like they're beginning to have production declines uh, as U.S. companies have really taken their technology and their expertise out of the country. So you have a lot of dynamics here where over the past year, you kind of got lucky in the energy markets that China really wasn't a buyer. China was pretty much still shut down. We were pretty lucky that China was shut down during this whole reshuffling of the global energy markets. And it's going to be really intriguing where we find those barrels and how quickly we can find them, frankly, uh, over the next year or so. So I think that's, that's an understated story here, but something to really pay attention to in terms of one, what will the oil price be? Two, how profitable will the oil companies be? I think that between China and a, call it a modest US economy and a non-collapsing European economy, that's a that's a pretty interesting floor combined with the SPR. It's a pretty interesting floor for oil uh, prices and a pretty interesting floor for uh, oil company earnings over the next year. So I think it's, while it doesn't necessarily seem like it should be the place to hide, it's probably the place to hide right now. Sam, in summary today, what should we be watching for next? Uh, what we should be watching for next is how quickly that demand in China really does pick up. If you continue to have uh, a decent amount of demand pickup in China, if you begin to have uh, continued breakdowns in the amount of uh, energy and oil being pumped out of Russia, and you don't see a significant uptick in the United States, it's going to be a very interesting year for oil as we move forward. Sam, thank you for your thoughts today, and thank you everyone for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianco Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks again, and have a great week.